Good morning, everybody. My name is Russ Gallowin, and I'm here on behalf of COPEC. Uh, COPEC is a group of, of professionals that agrees to provide free educational meetings and seminars to the public over a variety of topics. Uh, typically, when we start these programs, we go through a few slides and have uh, some disclosure information. Please feel free to visit copeceducation.org to take a look at that disclosure information and also take a look at the upcoming schedule. As you might know, we do have programming every day at 2 p.m. And every Friday, we have the Financial Wellness Fridays, which are presentation and I'm happy to give that today on estate planning essentials. So make sure to check out copeceducation.org and we'll go ahead and get started today. As I mentioned, my name is Russ Gallowin. All my information you should be able to see on the screen. I'm an elder law and estate planning attorney out of Dublin, Ohio. And today, what my goal is over the next hour or so is to take you through the most estate planning documents. Of course, that doesn't mean we can go through everything, but uh, I think by the end, you'll be able to help judge whether your current plan is right for you, or if you don't have a will or trust, you'll have a good idea of which one of those might be best. And even if, uh, even if everything you have is the way you want it, maybe you'll pick up some tips on how to help friends and family make sure they're taken care of. So, there we go. Here's our short list of topics to discuss. Uh, number one, ways of owning property. And this is really important. I typically always start here when giving a talk of owning because some of the biggest mistakes are made in not really understanding um, how the different ways of owning property what happens to it when you pass it away and whether there needs to be court involvement or not. Number two, we will talk about wills and probate. Then we'll talk about trusts and how those are sometimes used to avoid probate, stay out of court. Number four, financial powers of attorney. And those are often implemented to avoid guardianship proceedings. And then there's a whole host of important healthcare documents and then at the end, if we have, which I'm not sure if we will, I might point out some of the important Medicaid planning topics, veterans benefits, special needs trusts, and some things like that. How do you own your assets? That's a big question. And I find that oftentimes when people see attorneys or do planning on their own, they really completely ignore this question. But this is where I wanna start. I like to send out questionnaires to people, potential clients, and I want them to tell me all about their different accounts, who owns them, who the beneficiaries are, because this is really, really important. If you see on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see there are five different way property here. Um, here we go. Number one is jointly owned. So if you bank account with somebody else's name on it, or if you own a piece of real estate, like your home or condo, and there's another person's name on the deed, that is jointly owned property. And if you take a look at the arrow here, if I die owning a piece of, or owning a bank account jointly with my wife, who gets the account when I die? Well, it's that other joint owner. That's my wife. She gets the whole account. What if I die and I own a, a brokerage account and my brother is the joint owner with me? Well, if you just follow the arrow, my brother now owns the account. And it's similar with number two through four, accounts that have beneficiaries like life insurance, retirement plans, uh, or even bank accounts that are made payable on death, or things like home that might be transfer on death. All of these, one through four, are very similar. You just follow the arrow, that's who gets the, the account or the asset. So my point here is, nowhere 
in this arrow or this arrow anything at all to have to have to do with a will or a trust and that's because wills and trusts do not control or any property that has a beneficiary so that could be nice that might help you stay out of court when someone dies but it can also cause a whole host of problems this might happen where mom goes into the bank and says hey bank i want my daughter to be able to money for me, pay my bills, uh, make withdrawals if necessary. Oftentimes, the bank might say, well, go ahead and put your daughter as the joint owner on the account. Well, that can give the daughter the authority to take money out and to pay bills, but it also to take all the money out and buy herself a new car because she's now a joint owner. She can spend all that money one and number two when mom dies where does that money in the account go it goes to that daughter and that's even if there are four children and even if mom's will or her trust says that when she dies everything is to go equally to the children if the daughter's on that account that daughter can keep all that money that's not illegal it's hers under law so if that's not the situation you want, you want to make sure to avoid naming a joint owner on accounts. You might rather create a power of attorney that gives your daughter the power to pay her bill or to pay your bills and to deal with assets, but it doesn't give her the authority to spend the money on her own account and it does not change where the money goes when mom dies. Really important often misunderstood. So I want to make sure everybody on the call today understands that jointly owned property goes to that joint owner without looking at the will or trust. Now I want to point out here, survivorship. This is for real estate. And what many people don't realize is if they own a house or other piece of land jointly, you need to look at the deed to determine where that property goes when one of them dies. So if I own a house or you know, if I own a house with my wife, you would think that if I died, that house would just automatically go to my wife because we're joint owners. But that's not really the case. We have to look at my deed. If my deed says um, to Russ and Jenny Gollowin, for their joint lives, remainder to the survivor of them, that means that if I die, my wife gets the whole piece of property. It does not say for their joint lives, remainder to the survivor of them. That means that when I die, my half interest in the house has to go through probate court to be transferred. And that can cost, you know, at least a thousand dollars, maybe a few thousand dollars, you definitely want to avoid that if you would want the entire parcel to go to the survivor on death. Now, I'm not saying that everyone has to have a survivorship deed, and that's because you might own a piece of property jointly with a sibling. Uh, you want your half to go to your family, your, your children, for example. If that's the case, then you might not want a survivorship deed, but I want to make sure you know is. Okay. So one through four go to the joint, joint owner or beneficiaries. So that leaves number five. Number five is property you own in your name alone. No one else owns it. Well, if that's the case, then um, when you die, that is the property your will controls. So any property you own in your name alone, no joint owner, no beneficiary, that's what's controlled by your will. And your will um, must be handled or must pass through the probate court. So individually owned property, that's what is probated. All right, so key point, we went through these. Uh, make sure you remember these issues because this is where some of the biggest mistakes, most common mistakes occur 
not understanding how jointly owned and beneficiary property works. Now, what if you die and you don't have a will? Case, you still have a plan. It's just you've opted into the state of Ohio's plan, which is the same for everybody. Because it's the same for everybody, you lose the ability to leave your particular wishes. So for example, uh, in Ohio, if you're unmarried when you die, all of your assets go equally to your children. This is even if you don't have a relationship with your children, if you haven't talked to them in years, even if your intent was to leave them nothing. Or if you don't have any children, it would go equally to your parents. Maybe you don't have a relationship with your parents. And the example I used to give was James Dean passed away after a um, car crash in his Porsche. And he obviously was a famous actor. His estate went entirely to his father, who he didn't have a relationship with. That's because he lost the ability to say, oh, because he didn't have a will. So everybody should have a will. And even if you know that under Ohio law, the same people would get it, you still want the will because the cost of probate is a lot higher when you don't have a will. Where notice is required, you're gonna have, the executor is gonna have to get a bond to serve. So I don't think many people would argue with me, but a simple, at the very least, every adult should have. So we know that individually owned property goes through probate, avoiding probate. Well, it's really these three issues, privacy, cost, delay, and frustration. These are the three things that probate can bring to the forefront. Number one, privacy. Every document that's filed in the probate court for administering an estate is public record. So what that means is by the end of the case, there are gonna be papers filed exactly what I owned, what debts were paid, what expenses were paid, and who I left my property to and exactly got. That makes some people very uncomfortable because they don't want people to know what they had or what they didn't have. And maybe even they don't want people to know how much they left their loved ones. Because maybe then people try to get them to invest in, they try to, who knows the reason, but it's an invasion of privacy after you die. So if you're concerned with privacy, you might want to avoid probate. Number two and number three kind of go hand in hand. Going through the court process, there are steps, there are certain papers to follow. It takes time and it takes money, court costs, maybe attorney fees, um, you know, mailing costs, things like that. It can be expensive. It's not always overwhelmingly expensive, but there is a cost to it in time and in money. So when you pair that up with the loss of privacy, many people would prefer to avoid probate if they can. One way of avoiding probate and maintaining control of who gets what and when they get it is creating a trust. And there are really types of trusts, but I'm mostly gonna focus on number one here, the revocable living trust. There are irrevocable, and those are like lock boxes over here, chained up, locked up. They're to put money or a house into and make sure money's been in there for five years. It can't be taken if I have to file for Medicaid for nursing home care or if I'm sued or something like that. That's a very specialized reason, asset protection. And that might not be for everybody, the more common type of trust is what I want to focus on today. And those are the revocable trusts. As opposed to a big locked up box, a revocable trust is like a wagon. You can put your house into it. You can put your money into it. And because there's no lid on it, and there's no chains on it, I can take whatever of the wagon whenever I wish. 
I can put things in, take things out, spend the money, not spend the money. I'm in full control. So the wagon is a way to visualize what a revocable trust is. And the neat thing is it can avoid probate, which again, keeps things private, makes things move more quickly and easily after you pass away. So if I was to describe what a trust is, these fancy legal definitions where it's like, a trust is a legal agreement whereby a grantor creates an interest in the beneficiaries and blah, blah, blah. They're always really confusing. So I just like to use this trust or the wagon example. If I create a grantor, that means I created the document and I signed the document. I'm naming a trustee. That's the person that's in control of whatever's in the trust. So that's like these pumpkins right here that these kids have. They are the trustees. They're in charge. They're pulling the handle of the wagon. And they've named a beneficiary. That's the person that can take the pumpkins out and make. So if I'm creating a trust, a revocable trust, I'm going to be the grantor, trustee, and beneficiary. I have full control, full access, just like I do a regular old bank account in my name. If I'm married or if I have a partner that I want to create a trust with, we can both be the grantor, both be the trustees, and both be the beneficiaries. So again, full control, full access with a revocable trust. Now we have this same type of slide where we have the five ways of owning property. But if I created a trust plan, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create this document and it's gonna list who the benefit of my trust are. Okay, beneficiaries of the trust when I die. For example, for me, it would be my wife, number one, my children, number one. If you're not married or you don't have kids, that's fine. Just imagine whoever you would want to receive the property, that's who your beneficiaries are. You'd create this document that leaves those instructions. And after it's all signed and notarized, what we're gonna do in this case is we're gonna make the trust the beneficiary of our house, of our checking account, of our life insurance. So that when we die, everything is in this trust, in this wagon. And if we do that, because all the property goes into the wagon, when we die, we don't have to probate anything because we don't own anything in our name alone at that point. That's very powerful. Everything can stay out of court. Everything can stay private by using this revocable type of trust. Now, you actually still do want to have a will if you choose a trust plan. It's usually called a pour-over will. And the reason that is, is the will just sits there Hopefully we don't have to use it because hopefully all the property avoids probate. But if we forgot about a car or we forgot about an account of some kind, that will sits there, it scoops that property that has to go through probate and it pours it, just pours it into the wagon, fills up the wagon and then the trust instructions will control. It'll get where you want it to go. So you should, think of this pour over will as a safety net something that will make sure everything follows your instructions but probating that will does require a court procedure so it'll make sure everything gets where you want it to go but we don't want to have to rely on it because again that piece of property will have to go through court trust so if you have a trust or you know someone that has a trust and you say, hey, you know, did you remember to fund that trust? Or did you remember to transfer property or make your property go to the trust when you die? If that person doesn't know what you're talking about, they forgot a step. We want to make sure they set everything to go to the trust without needing to use the will. That'll give max time savings. That's what we want if we spend the time and money to create a trust plan. 
are, I'm checking to see if there are any questions so far. Uh, if you do, go ahead and just type them in the chat box and I'll check them later. But for now, we just talked about how you own your property and why it's important. We talked about wills and probate. We talked about revocable trusts and how those can be used to avoid probate. And now I want to take a little bit of time to talk about some common mistakes or other topics that are sometimes forgotten about. The reason they're sometimes forgotten about are because sometimes we just get so focused on or a trust that we just, I don't know, we don't concentrate on healthcare decisions or what if we're still alive but need someone to help us. So that's what these next few sections are about. Number one common mistake is failing to plan for men in capacity. Like I said, we're focused on what happens when we die, but most of us will have at least some point in our life alive, but we need someone else to help us because mentally we're unconscious or we have some sort of diminished capacity. If I, for example, again, own my house jointly with my wife, if I need to go to a nursing home and my wife said, well, gosh, we need to sell this house to, to get some money to help pay for the care, you would think that my wife would be able to sell that house because, again, we're joint owners. But that's just not the case. To sell the house, we need my wife's signature and my signature. And if I'm mentally incapacitated, I can't sign a deed. So we're in trouble now because my wife, if I don't have a power of attorney, she's going to have to go to the probate court, request the court appoint her as a guard. There's going to be a court hearing. Court investigator is going to have to evaluate me. We're going to have to get another doctor to evaluate me and send that. It's going to take probably six months, a few thousand dollars. And then once my wife's guardian, she can file land sale proceeding, which is another expensive procedure to get court permission to sell the house. That's a relative disaster in that situation because of the time and money involved. This problem is very easy to avoid. We want to create a financial power of attorney right here. That's a document that says, if I'm incapacitated, I want my wife to be able to sell the house, to file my taxes for me, get money out of my accounts, pay my bills, do all those sorts of things. If we have a legal document that gives her or someone else the power, we don't need court permission. If we don't have the power of attorney, we have to open up a guardianship. Court's going to name a guardian. Then the guardian can do those things, but has to report everything that happens to my money to the court every year. So again, like probate, it's time to an expensive public record. So every adult should really have the financial power of attorney. You name your primary agent and a backup or two in case your primary agent is unable to act and then they can handle these. These agents do have a legal duty to only act in your best interest, but of course you do need to pick someone that you trust because there have been powers of attorney that have abused their role and stolen money. So again, it's, it's somebody that you really do have some trust that you'd want to ch choose as your agent. A little tip here, you want to make sure you consider to adding some extra powers in these powers of attorney. Number one, if you do face a long-term care stay and you loved ones to be able to try to protect the money you have, you want your power of attorney to give them the ability to do that. If it doesn't speak to it, then you're not giving the power. So you might say, I want my, my, my children, for example, to have the power to create an ear for me and put my house and some of my money in it to try to protect it. 
If that interests you, you want that in your power of attorney. If it interests you, then that's okay. You don't have to have it. Finally, for financial power of attorney, this is really the one document that gets too old. And that's because banks don't like to accept them after a certain period of time. It varies on the bank, but I like to review or update the power of attorney every three to five years. I don't really ever want anyone to have to try to present a power of attorney that's 10 years old. I think there's a high probability that that would be rejected. So this is something to keep fresh every, every few or every several years. Financial power of attorney. Now, for most of the remainder of the program, now we're gonna be talking about documents and situations. This is often completely left out of an estate plan, again, because we're so focused on money. But I'll tell you, when there's a health emergency, these healthcare documents are just as, or maybe even more valuable than a will or trust. Number one common mistake in healthcare, number two overall, is not appointing a healthcare decision maker. If I am in a car accident, or I have a stroke, or any other type of condition you can imagine, for myself, well then the question is, who's in charge of Russ's medical decisions? And the answer is, we, unless there's a legal document that says who's in charge, and that would be a healthcare power of attorney. If we don't have a healthcare power of attorney, then legally speaking, the court might have to appoint a legal guardian, again, through that guardianship process, in order to say who makes the medical decisions. And of course that takes time, takes money, all the things that we just talked about in the last situation. And we'd like to have if possible. So an easy way to do that is to make sure we create a healthcare power of attorney. Healthcare power of attorney, it's a different document. It's separate from the financial power of attorney although it is somewhat similar. It's saying, if I become unable to communi communicate my wishes, I want this person to be legally in charge of making my medical decisions. Then you definitely want to name some backup agents, just in case one of them is unavailable. Excuse me. And you want to make sure, of course, that those powers of attorney are available to your healthcare decision makers. If your power of attorney for healthcare is up in your house and your healthcare decision maker has no idea where it is, or if they live across the country from you, well, it's not really doing you much. Once you create these documents, you probably want to make sure your healthcare decision maker, number one, has a copy of your healthcare power of attorney, and then number two, you might want to save a scanned version of it and make it available no matter where you are. And one program free that you could consider is here on the bottom, fidsafe.com. I don't have any relationship with them. I just think it's a, a good program for me. What you can do is you can upload your healthcare power of attorney and your living will, and your HIPAA authorization. And then in that and share those documents with whomever you want. And then they have their own little login that they can access on a computer or and have access to these healthcare information documents wherever they are. And so if you're in an accident in New York and they're in California and they hear about it, they can get on their phone, email, or send that healthcare power of attorney to the hospital in New York and then the hospital, they'll know you're in charge of the medical decisions. So there are other options, but that's a program that I use. So you might wanna check it out. We talked about the healthcare power of attorney a second ago, and that is to give someone else the power decisions for you. Everybody should have that. But there's also a living will. A living will, not everybody wants, 
it's something to consider, make sure you know what it is and then make your own decision. But a living will is where you do document your wishes of what you want if you're permanently unconscious or if you're terminally ill and unable to communicate. You might remember uh, Terry Schiavo. She was a woman, she had a bad brain injury. The question was whether she was conscious or permanently unconscious. And there was a debate over that. I don't care to debate that right now, but what I'm about is we didn't know what Terry would have wanted if she was permanently unconscious for sure, because she didn't have a living will is your document that says, look, yes, my healthcare power of attorney named someone to make choices for me, and that one, but if I become brain dead, at that point, I don't want my loved ones to be deciding whether to remove my life support or not. I'm saying ahead of time in my living will, if two doctors examine me, they both agree I'm permanently unconscious, at that point, I want you to call my loved ones, inform them that I'm in this condition so they come in, so they can come in and see me. But then I want the doctors to do what my living will says, which is remove me from life support. Don't give me CPR. Give me only care necessary to make me comfortable and to relieve me I may be having. That's what a living will is. So the question is, do you want to leave up the removal of life support and removal of fluid and nutrition to your loved ones, which is fine. Or do you want to sign a living will and say, I my loved ones to have to have to make that decision. I'm making my decision in writing ahead of time. If I'm brain dead, terminally ill, I don't. So people will choose to have a living will or not have a living will. It's a personal decision, but I want everybody to understand what it does and why some people want it and some people don't want it. I will point out at the bottom here, a living will is not a do not resuscitate order. So if I have a signed living will and I'm in a car accident and the EMTs arrive and they can tell I'm, I need you know, the paddles to restart my heart, they're gonna do that because a living will only comes into play after the two physicians have examined me and both agree I'm brain dead. And that wouldn't be the case in the accident scenario. Number four, we are sure our loved ones, or at least our closest loved ones, have access to our medical information. If I have a healthcare power of attorney and I name, for example, my brother as my healthcare decision maker, he would have access to my medical information, which is good. But my mom legally does not. And so you could have a situation where your healthcare agent says, hey, I'm the big man in charge. I don't want the hospital to tell anybody else what's going on with dad. Uh, and so I want them blocked from getting information. That's not good for family dynamics. So for me, I want my HIPAA medical authorization to say, I want any medical provider to be able to give my mom, my brother, my wife, and when they're older, my children, my medical information. So they can go in the hospital, they can told, be told where I am, how I'm doing, what that, without having to go through some gatekeeper that may try to block them from information. This is important because the HIPAA locks down this private information. If they give your medical information to somebody who's not authorized in writing by you to be able to get it, fine of up to $50,000 for each violation. So in, in order to avoid any problems with folks being able to be informed about your condition, that's what I want to do. I want to document 
my client's authorized recipients. I want to make sure those people have access to that HIPAA document, which could be because you gave them a copy or because you uploaded it to FIDSAFE or something like that so that they can provide it if they need information from the hospital and the hospital will know they can give them that information. One thing off is this is important for young people that just turned 18 because when we're parents of minors, take them into the doctor, they get their physical for football or whatever the sport is. And then the doctor says, hey, yeah, it looks good, everything's fine. But when that student or when that child turns 18, well now the parents don't have the access to that information. So if my they want me to be able to be informed of their condition, uh, they're gonna have to sign a HIPAA document that gives me the authorization to get it. And you saw how important this was a few years ago with the Pulse nightclub shooting in Florida. In that situation, uh, there were a bunch of young people that were in this club, uh, physically injured, had to go to the hospital, and President Obama and the Florida governor got together and they waived the HIPAA law for 36 hours or three days, three days in Florida because they knew that these people's parents and loved ones would probably not have access So that HIPAA law was waived could be informed of whether they were alive or not and what, a, what, what their condition was. So this is important for everybody, every adult, HIPAA authorization. All right, let's see. Time check, it's 1137. We've gone through the main things I wanna go through. I'm just gonna take five minutes or so uh, and mention these other topics because they might impact you or they might impact someone you know, and it works very closely with these estate planning topics. So number one, if you have a loved one or friend that has a disability of some kind and they receive SSI or SSDI or even Medicaid because of that disability, you'll want to make sure that they know about or their family knows about special needs trusts. Or trust for loved ones, we're planning on leaving that person money. But if we leave somebody that has a disability money, that could impair, reduce, or even eliminate their government benefits. So in most cases, it's going to be better to create trust a little box like a wagon and leave that money in the box for them so that they can continue to receive their benefits but the money in the box can be used by the trustee you choose to help provide extras that the government doesn't provide to that person really important because if you just leave them the cash they're ineligible and then they spend the money down and they're back to where they started Special needs trust can be really important. Also relatively new stable accounts, a disabled person or their family member accounts for them and then up to $15,000 a year can go into that account and that will not count against their MID or SSI eligibility. So make sure anyone with special needs knows about the stable account also. Medicaid planning, I referred to that when I talked about the irrevocable trusts. And actually there's a cartoon over here. You got the big bad wolf, which is Medicaid in this example. And the little pigs, they say, oh, don't worry, I made my house out of irrevocable trusts. So they're safe in the irrevocable trusts. They're eligible for Medicaid. Now the trick there is, if I wanna protect my assets from long-term care, and I don't have long-term care insurance. You should always look into long-term care insurance to see if it's a good fit for you. But if it doesn't work or you're ineligible, 
you might want to create an irrevocable trust, transfer a house and some money to it, and then after five years, that money, that house is protected. It can't be taken away. It doesn't count against the Medicaid el eligibility. So there's a little note about that. Um, actually, qualified income trust here, I'm going to be speaking about on behalf of co show at 2 o'clock today. So if that interests you, we can talk about that then. But that's for anybody that's applying for long-term care whose income is over $23.49. If their gross income is over $23.49 this year, they must have a qualified income trust or they're simply ineligible for Medicaid until they create that trust. So that can be important. So those are some things on Medicaid briefly. And then veterans benefits can be really important. If you know someone that's a war, which now is World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or Gulf War, and that wartime veteran or their surviving spouse, don't forget surviving spouses of wartime veterans might be eligible. These folks, the veteran or the surviving spouse, for between almost $15,000 and $27,000 per year tax-free to help them pay for home care, assisted living care, or nursing home care. This is often overlooked, so I want to make sure when I'm meeting with anybody protecting assets or becoming eligible for Medicaid, I want to know are you a wartime veteran or was your spouse that passed away, were they a veteran? Because this can really help protect some of the assets and make sure they get the care they need. So anybody you know, wartime veteran or surviving spouse, make sure they look at this <clears throat> at any time um, if they're planning ahead for long-term care or if there's some sort of a care need beginning that's the first thing they should look into. There is now a three-year look-back period for veterans benefits. It used to be that you could transfer money to a irrevocable and qualify for VA right away. Well, that law has changed. If you make any transfers, you have to wait three years to apply or else some sort of uh, ineligibility period imposed. So keep a look out there. That means that some people might want to plan ahead by three years or so if they're looking to be eligible in the future. All right, this is my closing slide I usually use and it is 1145. So we have about 15 minutes now to answer any questions you have. I'm gonna try to open up the box here for questions and we will see if any come in, I'm happy to stay here and answer the questions to the best of my ability. So either use the chat box or the uh, Q&A box and, and I'll see if I can answer your questions.